Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Vince Kenny, and I am the Assistant Director of Bands and Assistant Professor of Low Brass at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. Today's IBA lecture is going to be all about the euphonium, so I am really excited uh, to share some information with you all today. By the end of today's lecture, I want you to be able to do two things. Okay? Number one, I want you to be able to help your euphonium players, whether they're in your ensemble or whether they're in a private le lesson setting, to get better at their instrument and to become better musicians. That's the primary goal for what we're going to do today. So to do that, we're going to focus on pedagogy. And the second thing that I'd like to accomplish today is to just dispel any myths or answer any common questions that you might have about the instrument. Here we go. We're going to start today uh, with the discussion of basic euphonium pedagogy. Whether you are teaching college, high school, middle school, somebody who's playing euphonium for the first time, if you know the things that I'm going to tell you over the next 30 minutes, you know about 90% of uh, what you need to know to help people get better. And that last 10% Really, you have to play this instrument, in my opinion, to know the intricacies of the finals, but you can get so far with just a little bit of information. So the very first thing we're going to talk about here is embouchure. I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Brian Bowman at the University of North Texas as his teaching fellow uh, before he retired just a few years ago. And with every single one of our freshman classes, he would do the same thing. He would bring them in and then we'd have this freshman studio class where he would really work with them as if they'd never learned euphonium before. Even though these are all state winners from high schools uh, across the country, uh, he would start them all just by talking about embouchure and breath. So that's where we're going to start today. Okay, Embouchure is something that can be very simple or something that can be very complex. Whenever you have that option of making it simple or complex, I am an advocate for taking the simple route. Okay. You can either tell your students, okay, firm up the corners, flatten the chin, move your head like this, make sure it's this, and do all these things. Or you can simply ask them to say the word, hmm. So please everybody do that with me. Hmm. See how simple that is? I've said the word hmm. I have firm corners. I've got a supple inner lip that's able to vibrate. I've got uh, control over the embouchure, but it's not tight. Okay, And it's something that everybody already knows how to do. So again, say the word hmm. And that's your euphonium embouchure. That's it. If my lips, if you see people with the lip curved in or way puckered out, it's better to have them just slightly puckered out than to have them curled in. But again, the word mm should get you about where you want to be. Mm. That's it. Okay. Now, after we form that embouchure, the next step that he would do with all of our freshmen is he would ask them to start moving wind past the lips. Very simple. Now with your younger players, you might say, okay, now everybody blow some air out and then all of a sudden you see any number of a hundred different things and just remind them, oh, we're still saying the word, mm, mm. and then where, where your face is, just keep it in that position and then blow air so that we avoid the puffing cheeks and the myriad of things that could happen. Okay. Then the next step after saying mm and blowing air is you want to ask them to start letting the lips vibrate or let the lips tickle. So we're going to kind of blow air past until we get this little vibration. Okay. For me, it works pretty smooth, but you might see a lot of kids who are, who are trying to figure it out, but just encourage them to just get to the point where it tickles. If you can do that, that is one of the most, I would say, intimate parts of the buzz in that it's uh, more difficult than to play loud, to play, right, there's, there's no mouthpiece to help you out. You're just forming an embouchure and getting the lip to vibrate um, essentially with nothing but air. If you can do that and get your students to do that, they have a strong foundation for what you're about to do on the instrument, okay? So after you've gotten them to just get those lips to tickle, now we're going to take the mouthpiece and try buzzing a note. Any note, whatever comes out. Same thing. Okay, and then you can ask them uh, to play higher and lower. And to do that, we're going to shoot our air further, and we're going to, um, to go higher and faster to go higher, and we're going to go slower with our air in order to go lower. Oh. 
okay? Ask them to go as high as they can, as low as they can, and just make it fun. Like, this is a new instrument for them. Uh, it doesn't have to be great the first time. Just make sure they're enjoying the fact that they're playing a new instrument because it really, really is fun, okay? After that, um, let's go ahead and plug the mouthpiece into the instrument. And lots of books will begin on a B flat. Some will begin on an F. Let's just begin on an F today. Okay, so open. I'll ask them to do the same thing. Say, mm, and play. If you can get that far, you're already doing excellent with any student, no matter what the level is. You've got um, a good embouchure formed, and then we can talk about breath, articulation, and tons of those other things. So let's actually go that direction, and let's talk about the breath. Okay? Um, lots of times on a lecture like this, you would start just by talking about breathing. Um, for me, if I'm with a younger group of kids, I actually like to start with playing something. Again, just to build excitement. And then once they've got that excitement of, oh, I did this, now I want to try and do it better, that's when I come in uh, and start talking about breathing. Okay. Now, breathing is another thing that can either be very simple or it can be very complicated. I've heard explanations, right? We all know the explanations that are complicated. You know, it's all controlled by the diaphragm, so you need to lower the diaphragm and, uh, you know, breathe from here and think about this and make sure all of these things, right? Then we're talking about all of these muscles that we can't control, right? What we can control is breathing in and out. So I love to ask the students, who here knows how to breathe, right? Raise your hand. Everybody's hand should go up, right? And then let them know, well, if your hand didn't go up, you'd be dead because you wouldn't be breathing and it's necessary. So we all innately know how to do this. It's a little bit awkward because now we're doing it intentionally. We're thinking about the breath. So getting the students to understand that it's intentional and natural and that those two things don't have to contradict, they can be complements is one of the biggest things, okay? So you already know how to do it, but now we're just going to do it intentionally, okay? so. When I'm doing my breath, I'm not saying lower this, do that. I'm just saying I want everyone to take a deep, dark, warm breath, and that's it. And then I model, right? So I say, here's, here's an example. And then I ask the students to imitate the breath that I just took. 90% of the time, they're already in a pretty good spot because you've done a model and you've used words like dark, warm, full, comfortable, okay? Those words can do a lot to get you your students further, okay? Now, inevitably, you will see problems. They'll take in a breath and they'll say, <sighs> and you'll see all this stuff, right? It is totally okay to tell them, okay, relax the shoulders, keep them down, make sure you're sitting up straight, but then I always like to go back to the sound of the breath, and this is actually helping to train the students to always think about the sound of what they're doing first, um, rather than the, you know, the muscles and all of that. So what is the sound of the breath? Is it going to be an E breath or is it going to be an O breath? It's obviously, right? Band directors know it's going to be an O and it needs to be deep and dark. So then help them to understand that and create that breath. Okay. After that, to uh, facilitate just a little bit of control over the breathing process, um, I like to try and just do four, breath, four beats in and four beats out on the breath. And then we can go up to eight beats in, eight beats out. We can try to do one beat in, four beats out. And you can vary it whatever way you want um, just to help the students become aware of their bodies and aware of the way that they're breathing. Okay? Once we've taken some good breaths, I go straight back to the horn and we apply that to the horn. All right, so, so far, our students are forming a good embouchure. They're taking deep, dark, full breaths. So now it's time to start about how we're going to start a note, okay? Now on the euphonium, like any other brass instrument, we're using our tongue in order to create articulation on the front side of the note. We do not use our tongue to stop the air at the end of the note, unless it's like a special case of like a jazz thing where you're really trying to rip the end. But 99% of the time, especially, uh, on euphonium, we are not using the tongue to end the note, only to begin it. Okay? I've heard different syllables used for articulation, ta, to, da, and do. All of them work, okay? so it kind of depends on the sound that you want to get out of your players. With Dr. Bowman, 
Uh, in our lessons, he always recommended a firm da articulation. Vincent, give me a firm da articulation. Da, 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 is what he used to say. Um, so that's what I also teach to my students, firm da articulation. And again, when you're teaching this, don't start with how you're doing it, where you're placing your tongue. Just start with the syllable, right? We start with m. Mm, now let's start with da. So ask your students to say da. Da, da, da. And then after that, ask them, where did your tongue actually hit? in your mouth. Was it on the roof at the very top? Was it the teeth? Was it where the teeth meet the gums? And you'll get kind of a myriad of different answers, but ask them and help them to become aware again of the, the tongue and the way they're intentionally using it now. Okay? So after they've said that and answered your question, let them know that the appropriate place, right, the quote-unquote answer to this question is that the tongue is supposed to um, contact right where the teeth and the gums meet. Okay, so behind the front teeth where the teeth and the gums meet is the quote unquote appropriate place for the tongue uh, to be articulating. Do I know players who tongue further back and further forward? Yes, but as we're starting everyone, that is a great point from which to start. Okay, so after that, we would ask them to say that uh, da articulation and use the tongue to release the air. So we take a big breath, Da, da, and then I do an air pattern. And we should have a decently clean and clear articulation. Okay. The next step is putting more than one of these articulations together. Okay. And to do this, um, I like to use another analogy. Okay, the analogy here, well, the problem here, just to realize ahead of time, is that your students are going to use their air every time and try to restart with air rather than restarting with the articulation. You'll hear something like this. Right, and you'll probably physically see in the body them trying to start every note with their body. Now, to help them get over that, I want you to think of um, the airstream being constant and always moving forward. Okay, so a consistent airstream moving forward as if you were playing a long tone. Right, when I'm playing that long tone, my air is moving straight forward the entire time. Now, what I'm going to do as I'm playing that long tone is simply flick my tongue where the gums meet the teeth. Okay, so rather than air, 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 it's air, 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 and it's always moving forward. This is a very difficult concept for young students to learn, um, but the analogy that I like to use is that of a garden hose. So if you um, have ever been outside playing with a garden hose and you're drinking out of it, right, and you run your hand through it, the water is constantly going forward. That's your air. The hose is constantly on. And then you get these distinct spurts of water based on where you run your hand through that hose. The same thing is true with our air in that we move the air forward constantly and the tongue is the equivalent of the hand being run through the water. Okay. Now, also with this analogy, I want you to think of what happens whenever you turn the hose off and on again quickly. Right? Do we get a full stream of water at any point? No, we don't, right? We get this trickle that just doesn't have any life. It's a dead sound and it's, there's no energy in it. The same thing is true for our air. If you're trying to articulate with your air where you're going, you will not have enough energy to produce a good sound. So air constantly forward, just like the hose is on, and then run your hand through that hose, just tongue to break the air stream, even though the air stream is consistent. So we've talked about embouchure, breathing, and articulation, and now it's time to turn to one of my favorite aspects of euphonium playing, the tone of the instrument. Euphonium actually comes from the Greek word euphonos, meaning well-sounding or beautiful sounding, right? EU, beauty, body, and phonium, sound. So euphonium is where we get that word from. The tone of the euphonium 
is one of the best features of the instrument. So explain this to your students and let them know that they should always be playing in a beautiful song-like manner. Okay? Now, when we're teaching tone to a student, the first thing you have to know is that the student needs to have an understanding of what they want to sound like in order to produce that sound. Right? The natural learning process of observe, imitate, replicate really can't be beaten here. So observe. You need to play them a recording or demonstrate for them what a beautiful euphonium tone is so they say, oh wow, that's, that's what I can sound like? Cool. This is going to A, get them excited about the euphonium and B, start developing their understanding of what is possible on the instrument and what they can sound like. Okay, so observe. Imitate. Give them an opportunity to play the horn and actually try to imitate and sound like what they what they just heard and then ask them do you sound the same or different than what you just heard how is it the same how is it different are you darker than that is your tone darker is your tone tone lighter is your tone as supported or is your tone less supported and ask all these leading questions they know the answers that is a guarantee they can hear the difference but what you're trying to get them to do is hear the difference dr bowman uh again in in all of his years of teaching, one of the things he said to me that stuck with me is he was saying, I've realized after a long time that I'm not teaching people how to play the instrument, I'm teaching them how to hear. I'm not teaching them how to play music, I'm teaching them how to hear the difference. And in our lessons, he would constantly say, can you hear the difference? And then we'd go over something. And if the answer was no, it was so good to actually tell him that no, I can't hear the difference because then he could go more in depth in helping the student to hear that difference. So when you ask your students that question, really mean it. Don't just say, you can hear the difference, right? Okay, good, go on, right? If they say, yeah, just say, okay, wait, can you hear it or not? Because if the answer is no, then we can't fix it because we don't know what needs to be fixed. If the answer is yes, then we can fix it because we can hear the difference. Um, so, back to tone. Observe, imitate, replicate. Replicate. Reps. Okay? After you do it once, listen again. Play again. Listen again. Play again. And then over time, it gets great. Okay? So, other things to think about with the tone. Words to describe it. Warm, dark, rich, beautiful, song-like. All of those things are great things to use. Now, what words, what do we not want to be? Shrill, harsh unsupported, I would start with the words that we're aiming for rather than the words that we don't want to aim for. Another way to con conceive or think about tone um, is E versus O. In most brass playing and definitely in euphonium playing, we're always thinking of an open oral cavity, an O as opposed to an E. We'll talk about the high register in a little bit where there's a bit of a shift from this, um, but for 95% of my playing, I'm always thinking, oh, I've got the back of my tongue down, and I'm thinking dark, warm sounds. Again, if you can just get this, good air, oh, with the oral cavity, that's so much of euphonium pedagogy right there, okay? You will probably never have to ask your euphonium players, hey, go ahead and brighten the sound, maybe a couple times in marching band, um, but generally, more air, darker, bigger breath, think oh okay and then again I recommend juxtaposing a good sound with a bad sound right so you know how we talked about good air o versus e air do that same thing with the sound ask them to make the worst possible sound they can the most nasty nasally yeah, sound that you can possibly make and they'll know how to do that for sure right and then say now do the opposite I want you to make the most beautiful rich sound you've ever played in your life and they'll know how to do that too, as long as you're juxtaposing these two different ideas. Okay? Nothing can replace listening to recordings, just like in jazz music, just like in any type of music. So check out some recordings. I'll give you guys some links um, or some recommendations for artists they can check out uh, near the end of this video. And I actually forgot one thing on tone that really needs to be brought up and that's the idea of buzzing. So we're going to talk about it uh, quickly. There has actually been some um, controversy in the brass world over buzzing in the last, we'll say, decade. 
Um, there are some prominent players who have basically said, oh, I don't buzz, um, so I don't recommend that my students buzz. And that's totally fine. There are some world-class players who do not buzz. At the same time, a majority, a strong majority, like probably 90% of the brass world does buzz, okay? In my own observations of asking students to buzz and then play, and buzzing is just playing on the mouthpiece with it not plugged into the instrument. In my own observations, I've never, ever, I've never had a single time where I asked a student to pull out the mouthpiece and play that on the mouthpiece and then plug it in and had it sound worse. Every single time it has sounded better, okay? Is what you're doing on the buzz a little bit different than what you're doing on the horn because of back pressure on the instrument? Yes, okay? So I, I think that that is true. But does, does this being slightly different from this mean that there are no positive benefits to just doing this? I would say no, okay? And again, I've observed positive benefits every single time that I've done this. To me, the argument that, well, you know, that this is not, you know, playing the horn doesn't make sense. To me, the argument doesn't make sense. It's like saying, oh, well, I'm a football player, so I'm just going to play football. Uh, I don't need to weightlift, right? Is weightlifting football? No, but there are so many things that you strengthen, aspects of your football playing that you strengthen when you hit the weight room and focus specifically on them. With the mouthpiece, you are absolutely developing the inner ear. You're absolutely developing your ability to use breath. You're absolutely developing the ability to use a consistent breath, okay? And then tone is a another benefit through this method and increasing that air. Um, so again, there are some, some naysayers out there, uh, but I think they are a strong minority. Um, and if, if you're a world-class you know, player and it doesn't work for you, cool. You know what works for you. That's great. But for any sixth grader I'm starting with or any high school or college kid I'm working with, if they need to improve their tone, that is one of the means through which I'm going to approach it. So buzzing, don't be afraid of it. Go for it. I've never, again, I've never heard anybody get worse from buzzing. Now, once we've got a good fundamental tone, it's time to start talking about how we're going to approach the extremes of register, that being the high register and the low register. The first thing that I want you to do for all of your brass players is make sure that they um, are comfortable exploring these ranges. Let them know that it doesn't just happen immediately and there will be missed notes and those notes need to be uh, embraced. Right? If you are cultivating brass players who are so afraid to make a mistake that they're just getting really tight and closed off in the upper register, you are not helping them. You need to give them the freedom to make a mistake. With that freedom, they can grow because they know, okay, if, you know, if I mess this up in rehearsal, my band director understands and they want me to mess it up in rehearsal so that I can get it right later down the road. Okay? That was one of my things. I was always afraid to play high, and I think it really hurt my high range development over time. I got over it, but it took a bunch of time, okay? Now, let's talk about the high register first. As we're going higher, number one, I wouldn't tell students to think of it as higher. I would tell them to think of those notes as being further away. Think of everything being on the same shelf, and I'm not reaching up, and I'm not stretching for it. It's simply further away, and I'm going to push my air further and faster to get to those notes. So further and faster with your air, okay? Now, another thing that can really help to get up into the high register, and Stephen Mead is a big proponent of this um, idea, is that you can actually adjust the vowel shape um, in order to help you get into the upper register. So going from that O that we talked about to an E, and actually using pitch to air, the idea that your air is going to match the pitch and intensity of the range that you're attempting to play, okay? Just to give you an example of this, um, I'll play, this is just an F major arpeggio, uh, two octaves starting in the middle of the bass clef staff. <laughs> So as I'm going up to that super high F, I'm not thinking so much um, about it being higher. I'm shooting my air further, 
faster with intense energy and I'm actually shifting my tongue a little bit to say E rather than to keep it open and say O. Okay. One other great analogy for your uh, euphonium players is what I call the milkshake analogy. Okay. So if, you're, if your player is really struggling, um, have them pretend that they have a straw in their hand that is going into a cup that's filled with water and then tell them to blow bubbles into that cup. Okay, and I want you to actually try this as well. Go ahead and pretend that you have that straw and blow bubbles into that cup. You'll probably notice that the air comes out relatively easy, the bubbles are going, and everything just feels normal. Okay, now I want you to imagine that that same straw is going into a milkshake. Okay, so it's a, now a thick milkshake. Uh, let's go ahead and say it's from Wendy's because Wendy's got some some pretty thick milkshakes, and uh, blow bubbles into that uh, milkshake. You've probably noticed after attempting this that there's a lot more pressure inside the mouth. You've got a lot more energy in the air and, it, and you're really trying to shoot it past the lips. After doing that, tell your students to try playing using that milkshake type air rather than the water type air. And I, I think you, you may see a, a vast improvement. Sometimes it happens immediately, sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it's just a little bit and then they figure it out over the next week. For every student it's going to be different, but if you're just looking for a different way to conceive of the high register that isn't high, that isn't just killing yourself up in that register, the milkshake analogy is one that I've found a lot of uh, success with. Okay. The other thing to think about whenever you're playing in the high register is that you want to continue singing. Okay? Um, there's actually a high register book, I forget who publishes it, um, but it's referred to as uh, the singing style for high register playing. Um, and the idea here is that you are, it's not what you play, it's how you play it. So I'm not thinking about what I'm playing, high notes, what I'm thinking about is how I play it, I'm creating a song. Okay? Um, if you have Rochu Etudes or any other uh, lyrical etude book that the student is familiar with, it can be a great thing, or just a tune that they love, Shenandoah, whatever tune you want to pick, and then have them play it up an octave from where it's written and see if they can do it. They're, sing they're going to sing that tune so strongly in their head that sometimes you can actually forget you're playing the high notes because you're just focused on making the tune happen. Okay. Now, low notes. Low notes are a different story, right? If we're moving towards E to get up to the high register, to get to the low register, if anything, we're moving more and more towards the O syllable. So the tongue is going to be as low as it can be in the mouth, and instead of making the air faster and further, we are going to use a large quantity or volume of air, but it's going to be moving very slowly. Okay? Uh, the flow rate in the tuba register as we get in the, in the pedal register is about 3 liters per second. Okay? And your lungs are going to be about 6 liters big, which gives you about 2 seconds uh, to play any of the pedal register at a forte or fortissimo. We've got a little bit more uh, room on that for the euphonium, um, but your students should be thinking slow air and consistent and large volume. So that was a pedal B flat all the way down to a double pedal B flat. As you're approaching this, you'll see a couple things. Number one, cheeks will start puffing. Number two, corners will lose their integrity. And you probably actually saw that a little bit as I played as well. In my playing, I found that I actually get a better sound when I let the integrity of the corners go just a little bit. I'm constantly working to keep them firm, but as it is right now, uh, the sound is a little bit better with the corners just slightly puffed out. I used to puff my cheeks in the register. Some people do find uh, success with this, but again, it's always better to just encourage the students to keep the cheeks in while they play, and you can achieve, I would say for the most part, a more focused sound if you're able to keep those cheeks in and keep that embouchure formed. Okay? One great analogy for low playing on how to use your air is the idea of fogging up glass. Okay, Rather than intense air that is shooting far and that has energy to it, I'm going to think about the idea of if I've got a pane of glass in front of me 
and I want to fog that up. What is that air like? Especially this is good for the low register on tuba, but it's just as applicable for the pedal register and low register on euphonium. So in the high register, I'd ask for use that milkshake air. And then in the low register, I'd ask use that fog air as if you're fogging a piece of glass. Large quantity, but slow speed. So what we've talked about so far with our euphonium playing is very nuts and bolts oriented. How to do these things physically. When your students are figuring all of this out, I think it's always a great idea to consider larger ideas of what we're doing. Okay? Brass playing in general comes down to two elements, song and wind. These elements were made famous by Arnold Jacobs, who was the uh, tuba player with the Chicago Symphony for a very long time. He, he talked about these concepts with all of his students, and it really is the foundation to everything brass playing. So song, the idea that you have to know what you want to sound like in your head. You have to have the song. You have to be able to sing it and project it within the head. And then wind is simply the fuel needed in order to create that song or to have that song come out of the instrument. Okay? Whenever your students are, let's say you're in a high school and they're kind of trying to figure out the next steps and they've gone through these fundamentals of playing the euphonium, they know the right things to do on all of them, then I start really getting into that Dr. Bowman question of can you hear the difference? What is the difference between what you played and where you want to play? Right? We're working on the song, we're working on the mental aspect of singing what we want to sound like. And then, if it isn't what you want it to sound like, which it shouldn't be, because your song and your idea of what you want it to sound like should always be getting better and better. It's always kind of a step ahead of what you're able to do. Then, as you're listening for that next level of detail of musicianship, you begin thinking about what type of wind does it take to produce this song. And then your wind gets better, and then your song gets better, and repeat ad nauseum for the entirety of your life uh, or as long as you're playing the euphonium. Okay? But don't be afraid to go back to these bigger concepts with the students because just asking some questions like that, you know, is that what you want it to sound like? If not, what, what do you want it to sound like? That can really get them thinking and analyzing uh, and making their own changes. So now we're going to move into the portion of the lecture talking about questions and common misconceptions. And the first biggest question that we are going to attempt to tackle is what is the difference between a euphonium and a baritone? Okay, if you need a one sentence answer for this question, then that sentence is the euphonium is conical and the baritone is cylindrical. Okay, this is slightly oversimplified, but again, the euphonium is conical, meaning the pipes are slowly getting bigger like an ice cream cone, and the baritone is cylindrical, meaning that the pipes are a cylinder shape, staying the same uh, size throughout. Okay, now if you look at a baritone and a euphonium, which are two distinctly different instruments, okay, we rarely see this distinction made in wind band scores, which is why it gets so confusing, but over in Britain for a British style brass band, you will see baritone parts and euphonium parts, and they are literally talking about two distinct different instruments with different tones. Okay? When you see baritone or euphonium, um, and actually look at it in person, you'll be able to see this difference in the conical nature and cylindrical nature. To get a little bit more specific, both instruments have conical sections and both instruments have cylindrical sections. So if we look at my euphonium, right, this lead pipe is very cylindrical in that it's not getting any larger. We go through the valve section, all of these are cylinders that are not getting larger. As we leave the valve section, we see that it immediately starts to get larger. Okay, so it's getting larger, larger. We are in the conical section or the cone section of the instrument. Now the euphonium is about the first third is cylindrical and the two thirds after that are conical leading to a really open dark sound. The baritone on the other hand, I don't have one here to show you today, apologies, but for the baritone, the first two thirds are cylindrical and the last third is conical. So the baritone produces a tone that's really 
kind of in between a euphonium and a trombone. And when you li listen to a British brass band, that's often how the instrument is used. They use the instrument to combine the tones um, or kind of blend the tones of the euphonium uh, conical instrument and the cylindrical instrument of the trombone. Okay, so euphonium conical, baritone cylindrical. Now let's talk about a couple of things that do not have anything to do with whether it's a baritone or euphonium. Many people think that if you have three valves, it's a baritone, and four valves, it's a euphonium. This is simply not true at all, okay? A euphonium can have three valves. A euphonium can have four valves. A baritone can have three valves. A baritone can have four valves. It's all about conical cylindrical versus number of valves. One quick thing that you can do to check if you're unsure whether it's a baritone or euphonium, go to the main tuning slide and pull it out and then try reversing it. On a euphonium, this portion of the instrument is cylindrical, so I can't actually flip it and put it in because I'm already into the conical part of the instrument. On a baritone horn, an actual baritone horn, I would get to this part of the instrument and I would be able to just flip that main tuning slide because it's still cylindrical and not conical yet. So um, that's one quick way that you can test whether it's a euphonium or a baritone. Valves have nothing to do with it. Whether it's a compensating instrument or not, or not has nothing to do with it. It's all about conical versus cylindrical. And this, just to answer a few more questions on the subject, also brings up just questions, right? So in my concert band, what do I call them? Do I call them baritones or euphoniums? The history of the word baritone in this country actually comes to us from German immigrants. So during the Civil War, the Civil War musicians uh, that were German referred to this instrument as the baritone, which is why it started being called the baritone in the United States, even though it's technically a euphonium. Okay, so that tradition has carried on into what we write in score. So typically, you could see two things in a, in a wind band score in America. You could see uh, baritone or you could see euphonium. So which one do I actually play, right? Do I need to find a baritone horn for this part specifically or a euphonium? And that answer is no. Typically, if you see something written in the score that says baritone or euphonium and it's a wind band piece, then both of those are going to be played on euphonium. If you are playing with a British brass band or if you're doing a brass band piece with one of your groups and it says baritone and euphonium parts, those could both technically be played on euphonium because the instruments do have similarities. They're both pitched in B flat and they're both uh, play in the same register. So you could, they could play all the same music, but it's a tonal difference that they're looking for in the brass band. So if you can find two baritones, um, then that would be a great thing to do. Okay. Other things about baritone versus euphonium, you might be asking, how about my marching ensemble? Uh, are those baritones or are those euphoniums? Okay. The typical forward-facing euphoniums, right, the three or four valve and they've got the bell forward, those were referred to again in this country as, bariton as baritones, and we talked about the history of that word. But are they euphoniums? Yes. Okay. Do they sound kind of more like a baritone? <laughs> more often than not, yes. Um, you can call them a baritone if you want, but technically those are euphoniums. The forward-facing uh, bell front euphoniums that were now that are shaped like a trumpet, um, those to me, again, are small. They produce a very kind of nasally small sound. They sound more like a baritone to me than a euphonium, but I would still refer to them as euphoniums um, due to the conical nature of the instruments. Question number two, what clef does a euphonium read? Why do I have both treble and bass clef parts for my euphoniums? And is the euphonium a concert pitched instrument? These, all these questions are kind of around the same topic. So we're gonna tackle them together. First, know that this is a B flat instrument, meaning that if I do not depress any valves, I'm going to play all tones in the B flat overtone series. It does not mean that this is always a transposing instrument. It is pitched in B flat rather than it's always transposing in B flat. We'll get a little bit into this in a second here. So pitched in B flat, when I see music that is bass clef for the euphonium, that music is all written in concert pitch. Meaning if I see a C at the bottom of the staff, I play a C in the bottom of the staff. There is no written pitch to sounding pitch differentiation. 
the written pitch and the sounding pitch are one and the same. Very simple, just like bassoon, just like trombone, just like tuba. Okay, now if you see a treble clef euphonium part, things start to get a little bit more sticky. That is when the euphonium player does start to transpose. Okay, so the written pitch in a bass in a treble clef part is going to be a major ninth higher than the sounding pitch. Okay, so if I have a G written at the bottom of the treble clef staff, I'm going to see that and read it and play an F at the bottom of the bass clef staff. Okay, this is the very same thing as a bass clarinet or a tenor saxophone that's in your group. Now you might be asking yourself, well, why does this instrument have two ways to read? That doesn't make any sense. And yes, I totally agree, it doesn't. I wish this never happened, but it did. So now all we can do is deal with it. So in England uh, and in some places in America, they would actually start multiple students or all students who are playing brass instruments on trumpet or cornet, okay? Rather than starting with euphonium trombone and trying to get this whole spread of instrumentation from day one, everybody starts on the cornet, everybody reads treble clef. After a while, they start transitioning these students to lower instruments, the trombone, tuba, and euphonium. So rather than asking them to learn bass clef, they would just say, oh, okay, it's uh, the same fingers, it's just gonna be a bigger instrument. So they would be able to transition their students to a newer instrument faster by actually having them just stay on treble clef. So the question becomes, if I transition one of my students from treble clef trumpet, do I need to have them learn bass clef? And what about all my students who are just starting on the instrument? What clef should they learn? First and foremost, I will say this. All euphonium parts that you will receive, whether it's a solo part, whether it's a book, whether it is a piece in your band, will have bass clef euphonium parts. Some of the things that you order for the euphonium will have treble clef euphonium parts. If you do not have your euphonium players learn bass clef, there will come a point in their life where they either need to learn that clef or they need to waste a bunch of their time transposing a treble clef part or a bass clef part back into treble clef so that they can read it. I've had students who've gotten to me as freshmen in college who weren't able to read bass clef. And that was a point where we said, no, this is not going to happen. I'm not spending any time transposing these into treble clef and you're not spending any time because your time is too valuable to be doing that. It may seem like a lot of work up front uh, and you may want to just let them do treble clef for a little bit to get comfortable with the instrument. Um, but all new students, I would start with bass clef and anybody who transitions to the instrument after one or two pieces, I'm, I'm definitely saying, oh yeah, the, even if it does exist, the treble clef part doesn't exist for this piece. Here's the bass clef part. Let's start writing in fingerings and figuring out how to do this because it's going to be a pain in the short term, but have so many long-term benefits. So bass clef, go ahead and have them learn it. Now, let's say you've got a bass clef reader in your ensemble um, who's interested in learning treble clef. Really the only time that that's going to be an issue is if they want to play in a British style brass band. When I was a senior in high school, the brass band of Central Illinois needed a euphonium player, so I got invited to come play with them, but I had never read treble clef euphonium before. So I went and found uh, Sherry Huff, uh, who's a fantastic euphonium player who's living in Bloomington, and she helped me to figure out how to do treble clef. Um, that was my senior year. I'm really glad I did it. Found plenty of music and treble clef going on through college. If you're not planning on doing that, bass clef uh, will get you through what you need just fine. Our final question for today is, what is the compensating system? And the better question is probably, and what are euphonium players compensating for? I'll let you figure out the answer to that one. The compensating system is something that helps with intonation. Some euphoniums have it, some euphoniums don't have it. Some baritones have it, some baritones don't have it. Some tubas actually have this system as well. Here's how it works. In order to lower the pitch on a brass instrument, you need to lengthen the instrument by roughly 6%. Okay, so I've got open, this is a B flat concert pitched instrument. So I'm playing a B flat if I don't press any valves. If I do want to go down to the next harmonic series and do an A, I depress my second valve. And now the wind is going through this little length of tubing, which increases the length of the entire instrument by roughly 6%. Okay, now let's do this again. 
I'm going to go down another half step to my first vowel, which is roughly 6% longer than what I just had with the open instrument plus this. Okay, so now I'm down another half step. I'm on an A flat when I started on a B flat. Now, is my instrument longer than when I started or is it shorter if I keep this first valve depressed? It's longer, right? So if I go down, if I press this second valve again to go down another half step, is it going to be in tune or is it going to be slightly sharp? The question is, is this 6% of what I started with or is this 6% of what I started with plus the first valve? And that's where things start to get hairy. As we add more and more valve combinations, the pitch gets sharper and sharper. And where you'll see this is when you go down to a low F, right? If I'm, and I'm depressing my fourth valve for that low F, when I go below that low F on a non-compensating system, again, I'm pressing this fourth valve, so I've added at least a foot of length but I'm still using the same valves to add 6%. These are not changing at all, okay? So the problem is that things start to get very sharp. So I have a non-compensating euphonium here, right? Um, one other quick detail, you can have uh, four euphoniums that have four valves on the top that are compensating, those are very rare. You can also have euphoniums with three on the top, one on the side that aren't compensating. So watch out for that. If you are purchasing euphoniums for your group, check if it's compensating or non-compensating. Don't just say, oh, it's got three on top and one on the side, so it's compensating. People will make it look like a compensating euphonium without actually adding the compensating system, which I'm about to show you. But on this instrument, it's non-compensating. So as I go lower than low F, it's gonna get so sharp that I actually have to finger a half step lower than the note I'm playing. It's an actual half step sharp at one point. And so when I get down to like low E flat, I'm actually going to finger a low D. Low D, I'm going to finger a low D flat and so on. And then there's really no way for you to play a B natural above pedal B flat in tune, okay? Because the instrument gets so sharp. Now, how do we fix this problem? Because we know it's a problem and we know it's just a physics thing. And we know if there's a way to add extra lengths of pipe, we can fix it. So that's exactly what humans figured out and came up with. So that's what the compensating system is. Now, I want you to look at the back of these valves. When you see these, right, this, these are the extra lengths of tubes that are adding that 6% when I have my fourth valve depressed. So if I press this fourth valve right here, the air is actually going to go through my fourth valve and you see that it comes up through the valve set a second time. So the air goes through the valves, through the fourth valve, and then gets rerouted. If I press my first valve in conjunction with the fourth valve, then it goes through this little extra length of pipe, which is 6%, or second is this, and third, look how much pipe is being added if I do a four plus three combination. This is the amount of pipe that you don't have on a non-compensating euphonium, and that's why those instruments go so sharp. Right? So I'm compensating for the lack of extra piping that is needed to keep these lower notes in tune. This system uh, is popular throughout the world for brass playing. Typically, you won't find it um, on trumpets, A, um, because it's too heavy, and B, because typically they don't have a fourth valve. Could I create a compensating system where when I depress the third valve, it goes back through the valves? Yes, I can do that, and people have already done that but typically they don't sell because it's easy enough to just kick out your third valve slide. And who wants to add more weight to a trumpet when you're already putting so much stress um, on the body to hold that instrument? So we've seen the comp, these, val these pipes back here are what make the compensating euphonium compensating. Now let's look at the non-compensating euphonium and note that those valves are not there. There's no extra length of tubing for it to go through. If I go through my fourth valve, right it simply goes back into the main body of the instrument so that's why this is non-compensating it doesn't have these tubes on the back again if you see a euphonium with three valves on the top and one on the side that doesn't necessarily mean it's compensating sometimes it won't have those pipes it just looks like it is so that they can charge you more money uh, and not give you anything for it so do your due diligence and double check that it's compensating before you purchase the horn okay Compensating horns do typically cost more because it's more material. The valves have to be much longer to get the second thing through. Uh, is that money worth it? 
depends on your program, but uh, for anybody who wants to go to college, if you've got a student who's about to go to college and they're looking to purchase a horn, they will need to purchase a compensating euphonium to be successful and to be competitive uh, in, in college. All right, to wrap up this video, I just want to encourage anybody who's out there, whenever you have a question, always reach out. I will use one story, uh, Eric Lundquist. He was a student in the UNT Euphonium studio who was always brutally honest with himself and who would always ask questions. When Dr. Bowman would say, can you hear the difference? Eric would say no, right? And then Dr. Bowman would be able to help him. So if you are purchasing euphoniums for your band and you really don't know about brands and all that kind of stuff reach out to somebody that is the biggest thing just admit just say hey i don't actually know about this can you give me three recommendations i'm a middle school program we have this much for our budget and we are looking to achieve this right or hi i'm a high school band director i've seen bellfront euphoniums i've seen forward facing trumpet style euphoniums I'm not really sure where the trends are going. Reach out to somebody and ask and they can help you. Or, hey, I've got a thousand bucks and I need to purchase 20 mouthpieces. What is the most standard and best bang for my buck when it comes to purchasing mouthpieces? I would say that the, um, the world of euphonium and low brass is currently changing rapidly when it comes to brands uh, and when it comes to what you can get at what price point. Lots of the patents that were on these instruments have come up uh, within uh, the last 10, 20 years. So now we're seeing these designs that are so famous and that used to cost so much being produced in China for a cheaper, you know, a cheaper cost. Are those instruments worth it? Are they not worth it? What's the word on them? Do they break after a year or are they actually a really good bang for your buck and you're getting 85% of the horn for 20% of the price? These are questions that it's hard to answer if you're not a specialist who's just in the area. So I encourage all of you, reach out. People are more than happy um, to make sure that you're getting a good deal on instruments that you purchase and good deal on music that you purchase, a good deal on mouthpieces that you purchase. Everybody wants your students to be successful, especially in this state. Iowa is so wonderful and my wife and I are so thankful to be here. So if you have any questions, reach out to me. John Manning at Iowa is awesome. Northern Iowa, Iowa State, there are great low brass players um, all over. So just reach out if you have any questions. Okay, thank you guys. I hope you have a great day. Um, and I hope your euphonium players sound great. We'll talk to you later.